Hi there, I'm Andrew Bunnell, and today let's take a look at the angular momentum experiment in origin. The angular momentum experiment isn't very tough in principle. The tough part is you're going to have to keep track of a lot of bits of information, lots of bits of information. So let's just go ahead and go to it. So you're going to start out with this, uh, this applet. And for the first set of data, you're going to use all the settings that are shown here. Uh, you're also going to change a few things and just see how the graph looks and experience the applet a little bit. This is this represents a bar with pivots right here in the middle. And this center point right here uh, is the best place to put an origin. Also, this ball is coming in from the right side. But with respect to the origin, it's negative. It has a negative velocity with respect to the origin. So I'll do it one more time. I'll click play. And just take a note, it takes about six seconds of data. Or was it 10 seconds? I forget. Seven, eight, nine, 10. It takes about 10 seconds of data. And this part of the data right here is a little bit hard to see. So when you make a plot and trying to find the angular velocity, I recommend taking the second set of data. So uh, to copy it, Control A, Control C and then put it into your origin. Now I already, have, um, I already have a sheet right here with the data and all the formulas in it. Um, to make it a little bit easier, I'll zoom in just a little bit. OK. So now, in the first couple columns, is going to be our time and theta and theta 2 and our radius. Don't forget to put the, the labels. And one of the first things we need to do is we need to find the uncertainty of the radius. And how are we going to do that? Well, the easiest way is just to click there and create a scatter plot. And we see, well, there's where the ball is moving toward the bar. And then after it hits the bar, it stays relatively the same. So we can do the pool tool and just highlight a section of data and do column statistics. And then we just got to make sure the standard deviation is checked. We can uncheck everything else if you want. Um, and hit OK. I'm going to go ahead and hit yes and go take a look at the report sheet. So I have my standard deviation at 0 0.00229, which rounds up to be 0 0.0023. And let's see if that's what I wrote in for my next column. Oops, it's this one, but now I need to go back to sheet one. There we go. I actually just copied and pasted the number right there. I should probably round this, so let's do that. Round format cells. And let's uh, set default digits, and I need four digits. Four. OK, and it rounded to two, three. The next thing we need to do is we need to get some length measurements. And so to get some length measurements, you're going to reset the applet. Let's get the applet back up on the screen. Reset. And what I recommend doing is trying to click up here at the top and hold it for a second. See, I got 1.078. And then click on the bottom. That one's negative 1.130. But remember, this is the pivot is right here in the middle. So that's 0, 0.00. And you're going to take six measurements and find the standard deviation and the average length. And then you're also going to need to find the standard error. So I did that right here. And here's my measurements. And there's my standard deviation. And now that I'm noticing, I also put my standard error in this number, in this column, divided by 2. So I should have typed in SE right here and then pasted that value right there, which is going to equal to this. Oops, sorry. In origin, you can't, you can't do that exactly the same. So it's going to equal to F6, uh, sorry, F8 divided by the square root of 6. And when I get that, I get that number. And I could have referenced that number from this cell. In fact, I probably should have. Now, um, now, the easiest way to keep track of the data is to create a large table and even keep it color coded. So here I have a, an orange, and then a green, and then a light blue, and then a purple. And down at the bottom, I have a pink. And so what are each of these sections? Well, I got the applet settings up here. And then the next one is the initial, um, the initial momentum, which only consists of the, the ball because of the bar isn't moving. Then we have the um, final momentum of the, just the ball. And then we have the final momentum of just the bar. 
and then down here I, we do a total and then I copied the value down here so I could do a z-score and, and see all the numbers right here. One of the things I didn't do though is I didn't round all the numbers. Another thing that helps out in this worksheet a lot is this fractional uncertainty. The fractional uncertainty is going to help because if you look at some of the error equations they're really big. They have like uh, three or four variables that are squared in that square root and trying to get all those variables typed in just right is going to be kind of tricky. And so instead of that, if we make this fractional uncertainty, that's that piece that goes in each of those parentheses, then we can just take each of those cells and square them. So here I have all the values for, um, all the, values for uh, the initial conditions, and you should have the same numbers for this. Um, from the, um, the procedure, it says, assume that you're using a, the scale in the physics laboratory, and that, so it has a, a tenth of a gram for both the rod and the, the ball. Then the velocity says just assume 3%. And then um, we're going to assume 0 for the direction and the, the position. But then the bar length, you're going to take those six measurements and then you're going to double it. And so here in this cell, I have that value that I had over there, which is, oops, I needed my average. I didn't type in my average either. Oops. I uh, got my average from the column statistics, and then I uh, did that and copied it over. So I should have typed in average over here too, but that was what my average was. And then I times it by two. And then this is what my standard error was from doing column statistics. And then uh, this is the fractional uncertainty. So this column divided by this column. And here it's a lot easier if you make another row that's called index, just like I have so that you can get the notation just right. In Excel, if you start typing in a formula, you can say equals, and then you can click the cells that you want to put in the formula. Here we have to type in every single cell. And so right here it says J7 and I7. So here's the seventh row. Here's J7 divided by I7. Great. All right, so what is next in this green box is the initial momentum of the ball. And so, for example, right here I just reference the cell from the initial conditions and then once again oh control z and then right here i again reference the cell that's up there and so i just look across to the index and it's in column j j2 and the same thing all the way down now when we get to theta and radius we have to make a choice we can choose any location of the ball and the, the radius and the theta before the, the collision. And so in this worksheet, I chose the fifth row. Um, you could choose the first row. You could choose the 13th row, uh, just as long as it's before the collision. And how do we find where it's before the collision? Well, you can go back to your graph, and you can kind of hover over and say, my, my collision happens about the 87th row, so I can select any point of data before that. But what I want you to do is I also want you to highlight the row, like I did right here, so that I can remember to use the same radius and the same theta. And so over here, when I'm typing in my theta and my radius, I can see that I have that um, value right there. Next, um, I'll tell you about this formula in just a second. So in this formula, for example, I have D5, which is that pink cell over there. And then the uncertainty of that's going to be coming from E1, which I found the standard deviation of the residuals. Now, how are we going to find the uncertainty in theta? Well, to find the uncertainty in theta, we've got to plot um, the data and then fit a line to omega, where the omega isn't changing, or angular velocity. And so to do that, uh, you just highlight this one, and it's easier if you highlight theta 2, which is the rod, because of, uh, or sorry, it's easier if you highlight theta 1, because of uh, the rod is in theta 1, and once the ball and the bar collide, then uh, they have the same omega. And the reason this one's easier, it's easy to see where this happens. If you took the, uh, the graph of the other data, then it would be a little bit harder to see. And so you just want to drag it in a little bit from the edges. And then you're going to do analysis fitting, linear fit, open dialog. And you're going to do auto and quantities. 
sorry, auto and fit control. We can't uncheck that because we don't have error bars yet. And we'll come down here and click OK. And let's go ahead and look at the report. And down here, we see the residuals. We're also going to have to record this slope and the standard error of the slope as our omega in a next box formula. And then right here, we just take standard deviation or the statistics on column to find the standard deviation residuals and click OK. Now this is the uncertainty of each theta measurement and then that's uh, put together with some matrix math to find the uncertainty in the uncertainty in the slope. Now the slope is our omega so that's how our position is changing with time and after the collision it's constant. Now our standard error we need to record that as well and I've copied and pasted those values over here in our data. Oops, uh, go back to data and go over to sheet one. So I've copied and pasted. There's the uncertainty in theta, and then there's the two values for omega. Now back to the theta, we have to consider two angles. And I could open up the book, but instead I'll just say the two angles are the radius vector, and then the other one is the momentum vector. And we've got to pick up the momentum vector and place the two vectors tail to tail. And when you do that, uh, in this case, the, the one vector is pointed to the x direction, and the other vector uh, goes kind of over the edge, and I have this value, this 2.382 from this table right here. And now the direction, the direction up here for this first part is zero. But if I changed the, if I changed the, um, angle of the bar of the ball like for example this right here this this ball is going to go downwards or if I move the position of the ball down a little bit I could have a positive value and it goes upwards a little bit this upwards would be put right here on this this um, pivot point and then you'd have to arc it over to the value for the radius I know it's a little bit complicated but you just subtract whatever angle it is so if this angle is positive you subtract it, make it uh, that much smaller, and if it's if it's negative, you have to add the angle because then the the momentum vector is going to be going downwards. Okay, so right here, we what we want to do is we want to minus this cell right there, even though it's zero right now. We want to minus that cell because of for our next set of data, it won't be zero. And then um, then this uncertainty just came from. Um, the uncertainty of the radius and then the fractional uncertainties are just the same. Now what's the formula for um, the, un the formula for initial um, angular momentum? Well it's just the ball and it's just the ball traveling toward the, the wall or the, the bar and so it's just MRV um, M I just gotta make sure I get this right it is MRV sine theta MRV sine theta and take a quick quick notice right there I also have a negative in the formula the negative is because of its traveling negative with respect to the origin now the uncertainty formula is where things can get a little bit tough but it, they don't have to in fact I didn't have to even include all these square brackets I included it for this first formula because otherwise like we could have had to come and put in this one divided by this one, and then this one divided by this one, and this one divided by this one, all the way down the line, but we don't have to do that. Instead, we could have just said this one squared times this one squared times this one squared, or sorry, plus this one squared plus this one squared plus this one squared plus this one squared. And that's what I've done right here. So you have to multiply it equals ABS because it's negative, and then times it by this value, and then times the square root of all these ratios squared. Now I just want to point out one thing, that this ratio right here, you can either put it here or you can put it in the uncertainty formula, uh, but the radius needs to be squared because of the, of the formula for inertia. So right here, the radius, actually no, I'm sorry, this one does not need to be squared. What I needed to point out was this theta right here. Now this is a little bit different, the j and the tan tangent of the angle, sorry, the, 
It's the uncertainty divided by the tangent of the angle. And the reason that happens is because when you take a you take a derivative of a sine, you get cosine, and then you have like a sine over a cosine, and then that becomes a tangent. So that's why we use a tangent there. So here, this k13, make sure it's uh, a tangent there. And then so we have a value for initial angular momentum. Now for final angular momentum of the ball, now it's uh, the formula is m r squared omega, r squared omega. Up here it was v, um, it was v r v because of uh, the angle. But when you convert it to an omega, you have to do that uh, conversion with the r, and so it's m r squared omega. And once again, I just equal this one up to the top cell, and then this radius right there, I uh, chose a radius after the collision. So for me, I chose cell 100 because of I said, I know cell 87 is about where the collision is. Cell 100 is a good spot for it. And I just have to make sure I change. Um, oh, wait, I don't need a theta anymore. This time I just need the omega. And notice down here it has the same omega down here as well. So you have to get that from the slope. Now, right here is where I'm going to point out this formula once again. So it's the m r squared omega is for the, the ball. And then this one right here, notice how I just took this one squared, uh, now plus this one in parentheses times it by 2. And the reason why there's a times it by 2 is because of the radius of squared in the formula. And then the last one is uh, just this one squared, the k19. Coming down to the bar, it's very similar. We got the bar mass from the, the top and then the bar length, etc. Uh, remember, you had to double that, and so I typed it up in the first table. And there's the uncertainty. And now the omega, once again, is the same as up here. But this time, it's the, the bar length squared. And there's also a 1 12th in the formula. And there's a 1 12th in the formula because it, it's a bar spinning around its center. And so we got this 1 12th. And notice this time, I forgot to put in the bar squared. Nope, there it is, k24. So you got k23. And then this 24 is 2 times that before it's squared. And then there's the final one. And I get those values. Now we got two numbers. And we have to add them up. And so that's just easy. It's just the, that one plus that one. So I have uh, I20 plus I26. And then once again, we have two uncertainties. And so we got to take the first one squared plus the second one squared and take the square root of that. So there you go. Square root of the first one squared plus the second one squared. Down below just a little bit. Um, I got the, I just copied from up here so that I could have the two numbers close by. And I, so I copied that number as well. And then when I do my z score, I take the absolute value difference of those and then divide by the square root of those squared. And I get a pretty good value. All right, so let's quickly take another set of data. And uh, I have it ready to go right here. And I'm going to change a couple things. So let's go ahead to to this right here, and I'm going to change the mass of the rod to the ball to 2, the initial velocity a little bit less, like 0.5. Uh, position of the ball, I like that. And then direction, I want it to go up a little bit. So play, it's going up, and now it's spinning around. i got to get ready to take my data, but you know what? I'm just going to let it keep going for a second, and I'm going to type in my new numbers right here. So 2. 2, um, initial velocity, 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.6, and then direction is 0.2. All right, now I can come down here, Control A, Control C, and come back over here, and I can just paste right over that. Oops, uh, I think I made a mistake, Control Z. I need to go back one cell. There we go. Control V. I can choose the same number here, but I don't know if I can change the same number here. So I'm going to plot this one again. And I also have to find a new um, uh, velocity as well. Oops, I need to make this one bigger. Full screen. Hit the three dots. And I should have chosen the other one. And I can see that it's more like 1.8 seconds now. It, I should have plotted the other row, uh, the other column. Analysis. Fitting, linear fit, open dialog. 
I should have used last change. I can't uncheck that. I can come over here to uncheck these and click OK. And I'm going to hit yes. And I'm going to go ahead and copy this first. Control C. All the way back here. And I'm going to paste it right there. Control V. And Control V right there as well. And then I got to go find the standard deviation of the residuals. Oops, I need to go back to there for my theta. So I go to the last page. I can scroll down and do the statistics there. But just as a reminder, we can also come on this last, last tab and highlight that column and do statistics, because that's where that data comes from. I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK and click Yes. And I'm going to copy this, Control C. And I'm going to paste it back in the first tab right here under my theta uncertainty, which is almost the same thing. It's just a little bit different. And let's scroll down to the bottom. And I currently don't have the same thing. Why is that? Well, let's see. My li, oh, I chose the wrong cell for that one. So instead of i4, that should have been i3. And ball v should have been uh, 0 0.5. And that's closer, but not quite there yet. Did I choose something different here? Oh, uh, now it needs to be those cells up there. So it is C5, yep, minus the direction, I6. That's the correct one. OK. And I think it's equal to J4. I think I might have had that one. OK. That one. OK. Now, LF total, I think I might have made a mistake down here. So there's my omega, and there's my omega. There's my radius. Oh, I remember my radius is now has to be after 200. And so I'm going to type in instead of 100, I'm going to do 200. And there we go. That was the answer right there. Uh, I should go down and highlight it. But anyways, once you set this worksheet up, it's really easy to um, put in a new set of data. And uh, that's the power of spreadsheets. Thanks for watching.